Okay, we'll step back to the mid-30s with uh, a certain inventor decided to rebuild and recreate the Telharmonium using technology that did not exist when the Telharmonium was designed. And this person, with the benefit of the amplifiers that had been designed by Lee DeForest, not specifically those amplifiers, but amplifier technology that came from Lee DeForest, this inventor was able to take the Telharmonium and squish it down from two floors of an entire block of an office building into a single case. And of course, many of you probably already know that I'm talking about the Hammond organ. The Hammond organ is literally a Telharmonium. And it's just on a smaller... Uh, it's just smaller, basically. And instead of rheotomes, these giant cog-filled axles, we have tone wheels, which are tiny cog-filled axles. Now, Hammond, Lawrence Hammond, was a businessman. And he was building a product. His goal was not to be the fancy inventor of new synthesizer technology, but rather to create products that people would buy. He had a very, uh, he had a popular clock company before that. Uh, so his application of this incredible synthesizer technology was not to appeal to the futurist movement in, uh, you know, revolutionary changes in music, but rather to appeal to consumers who needed organs. So the Hammond organ, which is by all accounts, an electromechanical additive synthesizer was described as an organ and its tone bars were sort of aimed towards organ type timbres in the same way that organ pipes of certain footages were used. And why? Because there was a market for organs. There was not particularly a market for way out wacky additive synthesizers. So that's the Hammond organ, but that becomes important because while Hammond took this device and threw it at a very huge market for fun and profit, he was not unwilling to create new electronic instruments. So his next design, uh, which benefited from the help of instrument designer John Hannert and Charles Williams. His next design was our next step in the history of polyphony. In 1938, the engineers at Hammond figured out something really, really cool. Because in polyphony, if you think about it, you have two options. Either to have a limited amount of oscillators and some way to direct key information to those oscillators, which is challenging. Even Boda's design, you know, obviously you couldn't play that like a normal, you couldn't play it like a piano. It had its own performance expectations that made it kind of weird. And that's what would have had to happen. Or you could have an oscillator on every single key, like the Telharmonium or like a Hammond organ, but then you run into challenges like if your oscillators are all fully electronic, electronic oscillators aren't cheap. If you've got a keyboard full of electronic oscillators, you've got a very expensive, complex product. The guys at Hammond came up with an idea. If you divide a frequency in half, because of the exponential nature of our frequency set, you'll get a frequency an octave lower than that frequency. If you divide that frequency in half, you get an octave lower than that. So basically what they did at Hammond was they created a set of 12 tube oscillators generating the frequencies of the scale, uh, an octave of the scale, and they created uh, triodes that would then divide those frequencies in half and in that way create the next octave down. And then dividing those frequencies in half, you get the next octave down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They invented what is often called top octave division or divide down. And in doing so, you only need 12 actual oscillators and a whole bunch of dividers. So they created this situation entirely in tubes. And then they added a number of tube-based filters to the device. 
they added a very uh, primitive envelope generator to the device. And they even added an LFO. As some of you might know, the LFO might more accurately be described as vibrato. But let's face it, vibrato is frequency modulation. So, And also, it was the one part of this device that <laughs> was electromechanical. It actually, there were two LFOs that worked together and they were mechanical. In any case, this device, as some of you may already know, was the Hammond Novacord. And unlike, and this is a sticking point for me, unlike the Hammond organ, the Hammond Novacord was never described as an organ by Hammond. In fact, I have a brochure that they put out when this came out, and they specifically say it's a new device for creating new sounds never before heard. And since it fits the architecture of our synthesizer designs, and its intention is to create sounds never heard before, Tambul design, it fits the description of a synthesizer. I don't know if you've happened to hear the recordings, old recordings of the Novacord, which I will play, uh, have a, a very certain interesting sound, but if you hear Phil Scirocco's Novacord re, uh, re... what's the word? Um, renovation, it sounds... it's a polysynth. And, let's face it, it's a polysynth that could play every single note simultaneously. Like, say, the Telharmonium, but completely electronically generated. So this guy is our first fully polyphonic, fully electronic synthesizer. And it addressed this major question, like how do you create a situation that's affordable with multiple oscillators, an oscillator for essentially every key, although in this case it's oscillators just for the top octave and dividers for every key, but still the outcome is essentially each note can be played polyphonically. This is of course superior to Harold Boat is designed, which while very interesting and certainly uh, possible to create new and interesting sounds uh, polyphonically, the standard expectation for a musician would be to be able to play multiple notes on a piano keyboard like a piano keyboard could do, which this thing could. Of course, the Nova Chord, which should have been our entrance into the world of polyphonic electronic synthesizer instruments was not. And why? Well, it wasn't destroyed in a fire, so that's good. However, it was unilaterally rejected by everyone. Why? Traditional musicians who might have found themselves interested in these new timbres were drawn to the fact that it looked like a piano, but were repelled by the fact that it played in a very strange way, didn't feel like a musical instrument that they were accustomed to, and that what we would consider a relatively simple control panel was absolutely confusing and unknowable by someone who had never been introduced to synthesizer technology. You have to remember that this sort of technology, people generally did not have an understanding of it and it was a total barrier to understanding. They had no idea what was going on. Typical people who played piano keyboards were pianists or organists. And this was different technology even than organs were. So it was kind of a barrier. It sounded weird to a traditional musician, as it should. And then the avant-garde musicians came to it and said, what the heck are you doing? Here we have a very traditional looking instrument with a very traditional keyboard. Interesting timbres, but it's not. it wasn't a design that inspired people to create new music. It was a design that inspired people to create traditional music with new timbres. So, the avant-garde electronic musicians were put off by it, the traditional musicians were put off by it, and then this whole world war started, and uh, those the, the elements and materials that were used to make this incredibly complex tube-based over 169 tubes device were needed in the war. So, Hammond had plans to bring it back after the war, but then they didn't, because... Technology had moved on after the war, and that was that. 